Hi, my name is Robert Main from Marine Scotland Science. Today I'm going to have a quick talk to you about post smoke migration from the River Dee in Aberdeenshire. Today we'll cover what the drivers are for Marine Scotland in tracking post smokes from the Dee, how we capture and tag the smokes, the results from the work over the past five years that we've done, um, and I'll show some particle tracking data that we're trying to marry up with the real data that we've gathered. Marine Scotland Science's drivers for this work are primarily relate to the expansion of the offshore wind industry and the tidal industry. Um, salmon numbers have been declining for several years now. Um, since the 1970s, numbers have dropped from roughly 60% of emigrating smolts returning as adults to down to about between 4 and 10% of emigrating smolts returning as adults. And Marine Scotland is slightly concerned that this decline is as much as the populations can support. So we want to be sure that when we put these wind farms in that we're not causing any more damage to wild stocks. As you can see from this slide, the array has changed over the years and we've started off with a small array which is in in here about four kilometers out from the mouth of the River Dee. That progressively got further out from 10 to 20 kilometers over the course of four years. And in our last year, we decided that we would put in a grid array, which you can see here, and that was to monitor the fine scale movement of fish as they left the river. Um, unfortunately, 2022 was a very challenging year for catching smolts. And we did the grid, I'll show you later how well the grid actually performed. Capturing smolts in the river can be a real challenge. And the two methods we used to catch them were fike nets and rotary screw traps. Um, both are excellent for catching smolts in the right conditions, but if flow drops off and the rotary screw trap can't trap fish anymore, fike nets cover the whole width of the tributary you're fishing and will always catch fish and are very efficient at doing it. How do we tag these fish in the field? Well, we catch them out of the river in the buckets, keep them aerated and healthy, um, implant tags in them under general anaesthetic and put them back into recovery as soon as we can. And they are released into the river after two hours from tagging. If we start drawing down on some of the data we get from these tags, um, we can see here the progression over distance downstream from Dinnet, which is where one of the furthest up tagging stations was. And we can see the declines in tag detections through the river as they progress down to sea. The dotted line indicates leaving the harbour and the seaward side of that line is between 80 and 100, 100 kilometres from where fish were tagged. We did see some predation events in the data, and here's one that's definitely a predation event where the tag temperature jumps up to 37 degrees. This is either a mammal or a bird, so that's quite exciting to see in the data. And we also saw some possible predation events where tags have dived to depths that we haven't seen in any of the other fish that we've, well, any of the other tag transmission data that we've seen. So we, ex we think these two fish might have been predated by marine fish. If we move on to the directional data from the tags, we can clearly see here that while we're expecting these smolts, post smolts now where they're into the sea, to head all the way up to Norway to their feeding grounds that we traditionally associate with smolts, we can see that as they leave the river D, they, they certainly aren't heading north or even northeast. They're more southeasterly in their direction. Um, between Curtin, between the harbour, the end of the harbour and Curtin A, they're heading almost due east. And we thought, OK, well, that's exactly where we'd expect them to go, really. They're looking to get out of the river and go away and get started on their migration. But then from the Curtin A to Curtin C and to Curtin D, the fish dramatically change course and head almost southeast, which is really was really quite unexpected in this data. Um, there is obviously a spattering of them around, but those are the average bearings that they were taking. Really, really counterintuitive. Here we can see the results from the grid. Um, very disappointing, really, that we can catch more fish on the D to get a really good understanding of what they do in the near shore area. And next, we can see what we're trying to do with the particle tracking for this. We're trying really to get a handle on where environmentally 
particles would go released at the same time as the post motes left the day and try to work out if any of the behaviours we see from the fish are replicated by um, the particle tracking data that we can get. And um, what we're finding is it's, it's very difficult to match this all up. If we look at these particles at a further scale, we end up seeing that not that there's only very few patterns that take these particles up into their northerly feeding grounds off uh, the coast of Norway. Um, we're still working on this. This is very early data and hopefully we'll get a better picture of this in the not too distant future. Previous work done in Norway suggests that smolts, post smolts of Scottish origin get to Norwegian waters between May and June and these graphs are a representation of those particles that we showed in the last slide making their way up to these feeding grounds in Norway where they'd be available for capture in the previous studies and as you can see the grey line that indicates when they would be available for capture none of the actual behaviour we see from the smolts will get them up there in time so there must be some at some point these smolts change direction after they get out past 20 um, 20 miles from shore and 20 kilometers from shore and start heading much quicker, much faster, much more directed in their swimming to the northerly feeding grounds. And finally, what does it all mean? Well, it means fish that we're seeing coming out of the D and heading southeast have to make a correction to that journey, as I've just said. Um, where that correction is, we I, the the data we have here doesn't really give us any indication. What we have got is some small some small trolls that we've done off in the Scotia and some pelagic boats that give us a little indication further out to see if where fish are. And hopefully Matt will touch on those in his presentation next. Hi, I'm Matt Newton from Marine Scotland Science. I'm going to give you a brief overview today of some epic pelagic trawling undertaken by colleagues Robert Main uh, and Ross Gardner. And this trawling was focused on trying to catch salmon and sea trout smolts uh, in the marine environment. And it involved towing a large net. You can see this going out here out the back of the trawler and the surface floats at the back. You can see it being towed along, a, uh, along the surface. Uh, this is it's a very large net, requires some fairly big vessels to be able to actually tow this along uh, around about three knots. Um, it's an open, the net can be used either open or closed, so um, the fish can pass straight through and are detected on a camera. You can see a little smolt here on the, on the corner of the screen. Uh, and there's also a built-in pit detector as well for any pit tagged fish that go through it. Uh, or the net can be closed off and uh, samples of fish can actually be collected so we can work out exactly how many fish are in the, the net itself. And in the back of the net at the cod ends, there's a, a separator box here which is called a fish lift. And what this does is separate the bigger fish from the smaller fish and puts them into a, a special container at the bottom uh, where, they're, where they're protected from the trawling and the, the, the currents of the water coming through um, so that they can be released in good health if they, if they go back. And this was done over four years and each of the, uh, I'm just gonna give some results here. Each of the, the squiggly lines is a, an actual track of where the troll was. Uh, and the dots make up the, the catch. So the bigger the, the bigger the dot, the more fish that were caught. So the first first year this was done was in 2016. A, um, not too many trolls kind of testing out the gear, seeing if it's possible to catch fish. And then each subsequent year after that, steadily built up a picture of fish that were caught in the marine environment. A, um, and as confidence increased with, with the method and with the netting and being able to catch fish, this progressed further and further offshore. And you can see once we've got to 2021, four years of data builds up quite a nice picture, but it's actually quite difficult to see what is going on here. There's clearly some trends where there's a lot of fish on this south coast of the Murray Firth. Um, across both years here, 2020 and 2021, there's quite a few fish caught off, off Throsborough. And again, a smattering of fish up the coast here itself. But what we actually wanted to do was to change this into something slightly more meaningful. So we calculated CPUE, catch per unit effort. And that was basically by gridding the sea into 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer grids and dividing the number of smolts caught in those grids by the number of trolls in those grids. And so then each uh, grid space was be able to give it a CPUE. 
And to give an idea of the number of fish that were caught, there, over the four years, there are a total of 119 trolls, and we caught 1,020 smolts, so quite a good number of fish there. And to highlight a, um, some interesting bits of the sea, um, where we see some, uh, some different catches, a, um, certainly in the north part of the Murray Firth here, um, very few, well, actually no catches in this area at all, a, um, surprisingly so. Three areas of where there were more catches, B, C, and D. So the average CPUE for the whole study was around nine fish per troll. Uh, area B, this was 17 fish for troll, per troll. Area C, much higher, 29 fish per troll CPUE. And area D, 13 fish per troll. So these three areas we can see are catching on average many more fish than the rest of the sea itself. And then interestingly, hopefully you can just see here, area E, the begins to the numbers of catches begin to drop off. So there's slightly fewer catches out here at, uh, than there are in the inner shore. And we wonder if that is part of the migration corridor is within this area. Um, it's difficult to tell just the way the sampling was, but certainly an indication there seems to be more fish in this area here. And how far that extends yet, we, we, we simply don't know. What we hope to do is to undertake some genetic assignment. So those fish that we caught at sea, assign them back to rivers or back to populations of where they had originated. And we used this, uh, used work from uh, Gilby et al, um, again from Marine Scotland in 2016, who are able to apportion um, fish, uh, different populations by their genetics. A, um, and so you can see here the groupings. Some of the groups are quite large. So the East Coast area, which is green here, um, if you caught a fish at sea, you would only be able to assign it back to this region. We couldn't be able to tell exactly what river it's come from. However, some of the rivers in the Moray Firth, so the Oikor, the Shin and the Ness, these actually separate out differently. So if you caught a fish from this population, you'd be able to tell that it came from the Ness itself. Um, and we've got a couple of maps here to go through of uh, some interesting ones that have come out. So all these captures are from the Moray Firth populations. Uh, and the river is in white of where that origin is. So we've got the Ness, the Bewley, Oikel, Castle, Shin, the Karen, and the Conan. And as you can see, they're all following a very similar pattern. So the majority of these fish are caught along the south edge of the Moray Firth, and they seem to spread slightly further north the more east that they are. A, um, but interestingly, none of these fish were caught in these outer trolls here. So none of these outer trolls actually caught any fish from the Moray Firth itself. Um, they were only caught along the southern part of the Moray Firth. But you can see there's quite a strong uh, correlation there of area B on the first map of where quite high numbers of fish were being caught. Moving on into the East Coast region, as we expect, and um, very well spread out. If you remember, this is the largest genetic assignment region. Um, again, all the rivers in white um, where that rivers where rivers uh, assigned to that region. And you can see that there's a good proportion of fish here on this um, piece of the, the, the marine environment. And interestingly, where these fish are coming from, certainly somewhere from the east, but not the Murray Firth fish, it seems. And a couple of other unique observations. There were three uh, English fish caught. So these were assigned back to a northeastern river in the Allen Cockett region. A, uh, and some of the fourth fish here, again, fairly well spread out along the east coast itself, a, um, rather than all being uh, close together. Uh, catch trends for sea trout. Interestingly, for 53 sea trout were caught, and we think that these were mostly adults. They were in the 30 plus centimeter region. Um, again, a concentration of fish along the southern coast of the Moray Firth, but also quite a few catches further offshore. So there's a number of fish caught out here, sort of in the 80, 90, 100 kilometers from shore, a, um, which we possibly might not expect. We know that some fish move offshore, but I would suggest that this indicates there's quite a few fish out here at this time. And when these samples are taking place, it's probably not when we'd expect most fish to be out here and that um, we would think, we you know, post smolts stay closer to the shore um, through the early spring into the summer and then spread out. So these are adult fish that are actually out in the marine environment, utilizing it um, during the springtime each year. So conclusion, so we know that multiple populations use same parts of the marine environment, particularly in areas B and possibly in area C with different regions. There are certain areas C, B, C, and D, where we know that there's higher numbers of smolts than compared to other areas. Um, is there a potential drop in catches at area E here that um, are numbers of fish actually migrating with inside that? And we don't really have conclusive evidence in that, 
a um, certainly more sampling would allow us to identify that. Interestingly, no catches from the Moray Firth fish um, out here. So where have those fish gone that they're not seen in these these outer trolls itself? And the sea trout seem to be further offshore in relatively high numbers. And finally, just coming on to next steps, can we develop a quantitative sampling strategy? Um, it's relatively straightforward to catch these fish. The, the equipment's there and we know it works. And is it possible to use some grid or some transect sampling to try and actually develop a quantitative, quantitative sampling method? Are there temporal trends both within and between years? You know, over 10 days of sampling, um, are some fish being missed? Um, what is the, the general trend of where, the, where these fish are found and is it consistent across years? And what would really benefit from is some greater population assignment actually. So if we're able to differentiate more of this East Coast region into individual populations, we're then able to have certainly migration routes for, for each individual river. And again, sea trout, a, um, a great consideration of their marine habitats. They're obviously they're using a lot more of the open ocean offshore habitats um, than potentially we may be thought of uh, previously. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lindsay and I'm a policy manager in the Wild Salmon and Recreational Fisheries team within Marine Scotland. And today I'm going to talk about the Wild Salmon Strategy which Scottish Government published last year. Wild salmon are an iconic species to Scotland, but unfortunately their populations are in decline. So the graph on the left here shows the total rod catch of salmon since the 1950s. And since the peak in 2010, the numbers have been in decline. In slightly better news, the red dotted line shows um, the percentage of catch and release. So that salmon that are caught and then released back into the river um, that has increased rapidly and is currently at about 95% of total catch. And just to kind of reiterate the importance of salmon uh, to Scotland, they provide economic value through jobs, through angler expenditure, but they also have environmental benefits such as nutrient cycling and supporting freshwater pearl mussel populations and the wider social benefits um, of angling, which are you know, quite difficult to quantify, but they, we know they exist. So the reason for wild salmon declines is complex and there's not one single factor responsible, although we do recognise climate change as a significant driver of decline. This diagram here shows a range of some of the pressures affecting wild salmon and the strategy goes into detail about each of these pressures individually. So I'm not going to cover them all today. However, just to point out a few, we've got exploitation from illegal fishing and poaching, and predation from um, fish eating birds and seals, um, obstacles to fish passage, which prevent salmon getting up and down rivers, um, and water temperature. When the temperature exceeds 20 degrees, um, salmon struggle, and above 23 degrees, um, they experience thermal stress, and that has been happening more often um, in recent years, so that's quite concerning. So now we'll talk a little bit about the wild salmon strategy, which is why we're here today. So why did we produce this? So Scottish Government identified that wild salmon conservation was a priority due to the declining numbers. So it was a programme for government commitment to produce this strategy. What actually is it? Well, it's a high level document that sets out the vision, outcomes and the themes for action that we need to take to protect wild salmon. Who does it belong to? So it's a Scottish Government led strategy, but it was developed in close collaboration with a wide range of stakeholders on a stakeholder advisory group including non-governmental um, organisations, government agencies and industry. And how will it actually improve the things for wild salmon? Well, we will follow this up with a detailed strategy implementation plan, which will set out in detail the actions we need to take and also just provides us with some leverage um, to you know, make improvements in the round for wild salmon. So the first thing the strategy does is sets out our vision for wild salmon, and that is to have flourishing populations of wild salmon in Scotland um, as an example of nature's recovery. Now there are places where this has already happened, um, so in the Clyde for example, there's now some salmon um, in rivers where there hasn't been for over 100 years, and that's due to river restoration projects. However, we want to see this same um, thing happening across Scotland. So the strategy is broken into five priority action areas, and I'm going to cover them all in detail in the following slides, but here they are sort of summarised um, briefly in a diagram uh, format. So the first theme is to improve the condition of rivers and give salmon access to cold, clean water. Now, they spend a lot of their life in rivers, um, both at the start and the end of their lives. And it's an area that we can make a lot of change in because it's within Scotland. 
So important actions here include removing barriers that are impassable for fish for where that's not an option, and easing barriers. We also want to improve water quality by working with landowners, farmers and other industries to reduce pollution and reduce river temperatures by planting trees on riverbanks. And all of this will improve the river habitat for salmon. The second area is managing exploitation. So although salmon angling is very important for Scotland and um, for you know, the economic benefits, there's also a lot of illegal fishing and illegal activity that goes on as well. So it's a very heavily regulated area. We have the salmon conservation regulations, which assess salmon populations in all areas every year and set where catch and release has to happen. We've also got other legislation which um, prevents the sale of rod caught salmon and bans coastal netting as well. But as part of the strategy, we want to kind of do more here. We want to review some of the enforcement powers and penalties and increase the awareness of wildlife crime. The third area of importance is understanding the marine and coastal pressures. So salmon migrate from rivers out through the coastal zone and often to the North Atlantic. And here they, they experience a lot of pressures as well. So whether that's marine renewables, aquaculture or fishing. But a lot of these pressures are unknown in terms of impact. So this is something that we want to focus our efforts on and improving the knowledge base and the evidence that we have for these pressures so that they can be tackled more appropriately. We also then have a focus on international collaborations. So salmon spend a lot of their time outside of Scottish waters, so we need to collaborate with these international forums such as NASCO, ICES and OSPAR to make sure that we're all working together for the benefit of wild salmon in Scotland and, um, and beyond. And the fifth and final area that we focus on is to develop a policy framework. So a lot of the legislation is based on very sort of old legislation and it's something that we're looking at options for how we can bring that um, into kind of a more modern framework. Um, we can't say a lot about that at the moment because a lot of it's uh, not been decided yet, but that's, that's a key pillar that we're also looking at doing. And underpinning all of this is science and evidence. So, you know, we need to understand salmon populations, we need to understand the impact of these pressures, we need to understand how our mitigation strategies and management strategies are making a difference. So science is really important here, whether that's done by government, agencies, industry, academia, um, you know, we need to have a coordinated kind of one Scotland approach here to make sure that we can answer the questions that we need to answer to protect wild salmon. And just to briefly link this all back to Scotmare, how does this tie into the wild salmon strategy? Well, marine renew renewable developments are one of the pressures on wild salmon, and we don't know a lot about this. So Scott Merv done a lot of work to identify where the evidence gaps are and project ideas to fill these gaps. So examples here are what routes do salmon take on their migration? Do they pass developments? Is there an increased risk of predation? Um, are there disruptions to electromagnetic fields that affect fish migration? And hopefully through Scott Merv, we can answer some of these questions and improve the way that we manage um, salmon populations and marine developments. And just to really quickly summarise, wild salmon populations are unfortunately in decline, but we hope that the wild salmon strategy published last year um, will help us to conserve and protect salmon. And one of the key issues is the lack of science and evidence, and we need to make sure that we work with Scotmare um, to fill these evidence gaps. Hi there, I'm uh, Dr Matt Newton uh, from Marine Scotland Science. Now I'd like to give you a bit of an update of some uh, Scotmare projects that we have ongoing at the minute for diagonal fish. Um, some of these are, actually most of these are quite recent and I've just got the funding approved and I've just got going. So hopefully this is a, a, a nice introduction about where we're going next um, with Scotmare and some of the projects that hopefully we'll be undertaking. Um, we've got three ongoing at the minute. The first is a uh, basically a literature review. Um, for diagonalist fish and it's to bring together the review and the current knowledge of future research. We are tagging salmon and sea trout as an addition onto the prepared project in the Moray Firth. We've also managed to um, secure some extra receivers to add on to a large west coast tracking project which is tracking salmon and sea trout. Just to give a few more details of each of those. So the first one, which is the, the review of the current knowledge and future research of diagonalist fish, will review the distribution, movement and abundance of sea of all diagonalist fish that we have in Scotland. Um, it will also ev 
bring together the evidence for any potential impacts from offshore renewables and also identify if there's any substantial risk of that impact happening on the on diagenous fish. Uh, and then finally, we'll also identify and prioritise future research and monitoring. So where is the best bang for the book for some research to be taken out, sort of targeting um, areas of the coast or potential rivers or marine environment where we'd be able to undertake some research that would be able to address the majority or most of our evidence gaps. Um, the next, as we, you have hopefully heard before in one of the other presentations about a uh, prepared project, um, which is happening in the Moray Firth, we will be working with Dr. Adam Piper and the Zoological Society London, where we'll be tagging salmon and sea trout um, from the River Wick uh, and or Wester, certainly rivers in that region, in a hope that fish from that area will be migrating out through um, the Beatrice and Moray East and West wind farms, um, where there is a large, an existing large acoustic tracking work um, looking at benthic fish. And we have a couple of maps here. Um, so this is the wick here in blue, and the wester is next door to it, just in this little embayment. And each of the uh, the purple circles that we have here is where there is an acoustic receiver that's able to detect to detect fish. A, um, so uh, as I said, my colleague Robert Main is tagging benthic fish in this area. Uh, and what we hope to do is to tag salmon and sea trout from these rivers in the hope that they will be migrating or the potential for them to migrate um, through this existing array. And we'll also be deploying some extra receivers um, so that we know if the fish don't migrate through this array, um, which direction they're going in. And this gives us a, it's essentially a pilot for future years that if fish are migrating through this development or through these wind farms, it has a enables us to potentially look at impact pathways and investigate more any potential impacts of offshore wind on diagenous fish. And perhaps there aren't any impacts at all, but until, we, until we've tried to, until we're able to actually track a migrating fish through um, some of these developments, this is kind of at the level of understanding that we are at the moment. And the final project that we have going is some additional receivers for the West Coast, tra West Coast Tracking Project. This is a large tracking project on the West Coast um, tagging salmon uh, run by the Atlantic Salmon Trust here. And you can go on their website and find out more information on the collaborators with that project. And what we are planning to do is to deploy uh, a number of receivers across the North Coast here. Uh, to basically provide added benefit for fish that are migrating either through the Minch uh, up the west coast or from the Outer Hebrides to if they're going through this region here where there's potential for some wind farm developments just to see if we can get some added value and some increased spatial distribution data on fish further out into the MENA environment on the west coast.